All right. So I want to jump back into this leadership problem. And I'm sure you've heard this saying, it's oft repeated, hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men, weak, time, weak men create hard times, and the cycle repeats. So you've heard my adjustment to this. I don't think I have. No. Strong, strong, smart men create good times and nuclear weapons. Good times create weak men. Weak men and nuclear weapons create end times. Well, that's scary. <laughs> well, I'm just trying to say that there's something about this reflexive fourth turning ideology that I just don't agree with. That game doesn't go on infinitely. Agreed. Agreed. I think your, your point being here that we can reach a point of technological sophistication that we stop, blow up the cycle or stop the game entirely, which we're at risk of now. Yep. Since 1952-53, that, that game changed. Yeah. Okay. Fair point. So what I'd like to drill in to here, and, and this is a good example of that, that I think incentives are the actual, the soil from which our individual characters are born, right? And there's the old saying, no man is better than his incentives. So I take a bit of an issue with when, when you're saying, if we had better leaders or stronger leaders or the leaders from the past that we could somehow navigate these institutions today in the right direction, I think the problem is actually the incentives themselves, the misalignment of incentives. Well, I'm largely not related. What's that? Let's find the disagreement. I don't disagree with you yet. So I don't know if you're taking an issue with me or what you imagine my perspective. Well, I might be wrong about your perspective. So I I, I, in my mind, what I heard you say earlier was if we had stronger leaders or better leaders, it could help rectify our current institutional malaise. But that is an issue of incentives. Agreed. So what I'm saying is you couldn't, in my mind, you couldn't go and pluck George Washington or name your favorite leader from the past and put them in the driver's seat today. And that would fix things. I mean, maybe it would help to some extent, but I don't think it would fix things. I think the incentives uh, a George Washington or whoever was facing would gradually corrupt that character, whether, whether it was that individual or not, or maybe his, his successor. Um, but I guess the main point I'm, I'm trying to make here is that it's systemic change that we have to make, not, if we look at the in, the individual, if we say like, oh, we need to get Biden out of office and someone else in office. I think we're just masking over the symptom of flawed incentives, ultimately. Joe, you know, I'm not disagreeing with that. I mean, the, the issue, first of all, um, of if you were able to fiat George Washington into modern office, mm -hmm. you would be evading one of the key incentive problems, which is the existence of primaries and election cycles with their toll of personal destruction, which causes people of quality not to want to engage. Mm -hmm. So first of all, you just fiat it around the incentive structure. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I really do believe, of course, that if you give people a plausible route to immortality, and you don't make fun of it. Like, let's, let's just think about the sheer number of things named Washington. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not small. Right. Right? Number of things that... I, I don't even know how to say it. It's important to believe in multi-generational legacy. Most of us can't get there because we don't believe in we don't believe in an afterlife. We don't believe in God. We don't believe in our country's mythology. We don't believe in anything. Mm -hmm. We're too smart for all of that stuff. And that means you can't pay people in immortality, which is one of the things that we used to do. We're still talking about Leonardo da Vinci. He's not here to hear us do it. But we the reason we discuss Michelangelo or Beethoven or Bach or any of these people. Um, is because they made some lasting 
contribution and we wish to acknowledge. So Shakespeare, you're dead, but your work lives on. Mm -hmm. I don't think modern people care. As a result of their incentives? Sort of, yeah. Like, you know, there are a lot of bad statues that have been erected for nefarious purposes. Let's take those out of the equation. People have started to say, like, why would anyone want a statue? Mm. Or why would anyone want their name on a football stadium? Or why would any? So as soon as you get this kind of nihilistic um, question, which is, isn't it weird to want people to say your name after you're gone to remember what you accomplished while you were alive? Isn't glory narcissistic? You're setting up the world's worst incentive system because nobody wants to sacrifice. Like, did Lincoln make a great deal for himself? Probably not. He got killed at a theatrical performance. You know, for all he went through the Civil War, and for all that work, he's re rewarded by being killed at a theater performance. Mm. Would Martin Luther King Jr. have done what he did if he knew he was going to get gunned down in a motel? Why would anybody do anything if this sort of, well, it goes back to the lyric from As Time Goes By in the movie Casablanca, which we're still talking about. It's still the same old story, a fight for love and glory, a case of do or die. I don't think they could have conceived of 2021 where nobody is allowed to care about such things openly. So what's changed? What, what, what in your mind has created the culture we are witnessing in 2021, which is apparently, I mean, I'll let you describe it as you want, but it's very shallow, you could say, relative to the, these cultures of bygone eras that did care about things intergenerationally. What do you think has changed? Well, I think one thing is, is that the American dream stopped paying a dividend. The American dream came from American culture, which is surprisingly counterintuitive. It's a very advanced culture. This idea that you live in a free society and you're not going to avail yourself of all, almost all of the freedoms that accrue to you. Like in general, most of us didn't explore our freedoms to the point where we were even doing anything that edgy to bother each other because we had the freedoms. If we, you know, there's some point at which Jewish attorneys are defending the right of Nazis to march in Jewish neighborhoods because it's part of the American deal. No Jewish lawyer wants Nazis marching through their neighborhood, but it's a counterintuitive sort of a thing to be an American. And as long as that counterintuition that we were going to stand up for each other's right to say whatever uh, is on his or her mind, even though the rest of us may not want to hear it. It's hard, hard to imagine that. Huh. Um, when we stopped paying a dividend, people suddenly said, why am I doing all these counterintuitive things? If I'm not going to get rich or, or relatively rich, and again, just by showing up, that's it's not the American dream isn't learn to code and become an entrepreneur. It's just just be a decent enough person and you'll be fine. Right. And you know, invest in your education, try not to hurt people, shave, <laughs> go to work, it'll be okay. This means you, Robert. I, I missed um, the, miss the shave memo. <laughs> I missed the shave memo. So that thing stopped paying a dividend and so people gave up on the culture and then the atheism you know i come from an atheistic background and you, you're supposed to know that you have to keep enough of that religious feeling in order to make sure that your atheism doesn't take you right off the rails mm -hmm. and i may not believe in god but i certainly care about whether people are going to think that I accomplished something while I was here or that my children will, something like that. Mm. And, you know, when I talk in those terms, people find it to be peculiar. They find any desire to try to lead Hitlerian, 
They find any desire to be thought well of narcissistic, uh, some sort of an out of control ego. Um, I'm not quite sure how we got this dumb, but we are not, we are not able to set up incentive structures where people would be rewarded. Like, let me ask you a question. If you found out that a cop made a drug bust and there was a hundred million dollars approximately in as part of the drug bust. And you found out that that person didn't put even 1 million of it in, in his or her own pocket. Would you think more or less highly of that person if they had the ability to do so without being caught? Um, don't answer the question. Don't, don't answer the question. Okay. Just for clarity, I think so it's the police officer, right? We're talking yeah, about the police officer makes a bust. Okay. Nobody knows how much money is there. There's an opportunity to put a quick million in your pocket person either chooses to put the quick million in the pocket or not. In the old era, you would think more maybe of the person for having the moral fiber not to enrich themselves. Mm -hmm. In the modern era, you'd think, ha, that sucker, well, what does the policeman even get paid these days? You'd be crazy not to. And I think that that's sort of indicative of where we are as in the previous world, that good moral fiber was hoped to provide for a decent life. You know, I don't know if you've ever listened to the lyrics of Atlantic City by Bruce Springsteen. Not sure. Oh, there's a song that'll rip your heart straight out. Um, but he says something about, I tried to put some money away, but I've got the sort of debts no honest man can pay. And, you know, he's talking about doing a favor for a guy in the mob and letting your mind wander as to what a favor for a guy in the mob might be like. But the idea is we all understand his constraints. Things haven't worked out. He's not going to have a decent life. He's trying to play by the rules. It's not working. And that's what leads to this destruction of culture. Mm -hmm. is, is that you can't point to people. If I found out that somebody had made $20 million honestly, but it had the opportunity to make $200 million doing something nefarious, mm -hmm. I respect the guy for making $20 million and not doing something nefarious. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if that guy ends up living under an underpass and, you know, studied for some sort of medical specialty in radiology and things haven't worked out and blah, 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 blah. I can easily become sympathetic to that person doing something untoward because the system hasn't been fair and responsible. Well, I think you're hitting the nail on the head here. The, the problem with having a central bank in the modern economy is that it makes more and more people that are playing by the rules causes them to be dispossessed right and this yeah. is this is obvious among, along many different dimensions but you could think of one person working full time being able to support a family of four maybe in the 60s 50s whatever that is a complete impossibility today like two adults working full time is barely uh, enough enough to cover um, what once only took one person. So right, I agree. Yeah. Isn't that? I mean, so you, you're saying that is. Look, we're in a pre-revolutionary time from the perspective of the amount of inequality, the amount of manipulation. One possibility is that Bitcoin and decentralized finance and all these kinds of things conspire to take some of the pressure off of the system and give people an option that the governments of the world may not want, but that it's a route around where instead of dealing with the monopoly on violence, you're dealing with the monopoly uh, on number theory, if you will, uh, to enforce contracts and money uh, without the guns. That's hopeful. Yeah. So, so to revisit the analogy you used earlier, dancing on a cruise ship versus dancing in a lifeboat. <laughs> or I guess aerobics was the yeah. example you gave. Yeah. 
I view Bitcoin as it is this lifeboat out of the fiat system that is becoming a cruise ship as more people get on it, right? The more people board this new monetary paradigm, yeah. the more stable it becomes and the more secure it is as money, the more certain it's, it's continued okay. existence, et cetera, et cetera. So isn't this the answer then? To ha so to have people in a social institution where opinion cannot corrupt the rules, so then you have people playing by fixed rules. Isn't this the pathway towards a peaceful civilization? Is we know that it, when I'm, it's very Darwinian that when you can't take an attack vector on the rules themselves, like as yeah. a, what a central bank is effectively doing, saying, I'm going to control the rules. I'm going to twist them and dial them according to my own political agenda or self-interest, whatever it is. When you remove that as an option and then everyone's forced to play by fixed and certain rules. Isn't that the pathway out of this cultural malaise? Yes and no. I mean, I, I don't know how to... See, the Bitcoiners tend to be money geeks. And not everybody is actually focused on money the way Bitcoiners are focused on money. Right? I mean, I, I know artists. I know musicians, for example, who in a previous era made a wonderful living by just doing what they loved into a microphone. And the world was their oyster. And then, you know, th there was this whole MP3 revolution and file sharing networks, and suddenly they couldn't earn a living doing what they had been doing. Th there's a way in which, yeah, if you're a money geek, Maybe this is your thing. You know, you're comfortable taking and managing and bearing risk. You believe that these rules are not going to change much because of the 51% difficulty rule of trying to change uh, the protocols. Um, but, you know, it's very much based on this idea that the past, you know, decade plus is going to be indicative of what happens in the future. And if that's what happens in the future, then that's what, that's going to be what happens. I can't say for, for sure. I'm, and I'm not against the, the role that Bitcoin has of getting us out, but I, I think you don't understand how difficult it is to replace certain cultures. Like the mm -hmm. army has a culture. There are military families that take great pride in saying that we've had four generations go through the military academy and into service as officers mm -hmm. and you're not going to replace that with a token. And I, I know you, you ever watch a hospital that's stretched to its, ma its maximum limits and you know, the doctors and nurses and orderlies and stuff just come in with energy from God knows where and make things happen. People stay late. I mean, I, I, look, the, there's just an irritation that I have. I don't know how to talk about it. It's not all about money. Mm. There are things that are happening in the world that you cannot get through money. It's not all about fix the money, fix the world. Yes, it will contribute to a better culture. But Bitcoin does not explain why somebody joins their country's armed services and agrees to fight on its behalf. There are lots of things that money can't really easily explain. And I think it's just important to say that what's fixable by money might be fixable by hard money. I do think you guys need to worry about a deflationary world. I think that because the inflationary world is sold, it makes it sound like, well, the deflationary world must be amazing um, because of the enormous distortion of the inflationary world that's pushed on us. And I worry that, that maybe the Bitcoiners don't understand that hard money can create its own terrible problems. The inability to tell a system what to do is also a terrifying prospect. Maybe if you believe that the invisible hand is near perfect mm -hmm. or that it's automatically better than anything else, you know, I, I can understand those arguments. But you have to realize that once you lock yourself out of a system, it's going to do things you never expected. And you're on the hook for it. 
Yeah, <clears throat> again, I mean, if we're looking at markets as an extension of evolution, as we touched on earlier, yeah, that's what evolution does, right? It adapts to the invariance that it faces, whether it's gravity or natural selection or the uh, concentration of oxygen in the atmosphere, like it adapts to these things. So my view is just simply by getting us into a place where the money or the incentives are actually invariant, it allows people yep. to formulate longer term, more productive strategies. Right. But think about like, if you actually observe the natural world, there's nothing quite as twisted as nature itself. I mean, I could go into all the horrific species th that make sense evolutionarily. And you'll be throwing up throughout the day if you actually think about what these species are and why these systems work. You know? Um, uh, I'm just thinking of a couple of species I don't really <laughs> want to talk about. Uh, it's also beautiful, right? I mean, what else? I mean, nature is the most well, Okay, but then you're, you're inviting that beauty into your world. There might be a beauty to... Uh, to massacre. There might be a strategic beauty into tricking civilian populations into things that are going to. It might be a beauty into putting lead in the enemy's drinking water. I mean, you have to be really careful about talking about the beauty of nature. Nature just cares about strategies that work. Agreed completely. And I, yeah. this is, this is the, the crux of Bitcoin in my mind is that it makes coercion a non fruitful or non productive strategy that it's just much because it's property that is more expensive to violate. It incentivizes market actors to go into enterprises that are not centered on the violation of property. This is what you're going to keep. We all understand the idea that something that is more Adam Smith is going to give you better invisible hand dynamics, right? Yes, yes. Okay. So I, I don't, it's not like I fail to grasp this. I think what I'm trying to say is markets also do weird things. What happens when the market figures out what the price of a contract killing is? What happens when that becomes efficient? Mm hmm you know, um, all sorts of things that markets can do, they shouldn't do. That's why we have humans that remain engaged. When we try to lock ourselves out of a system, mm -hmm. because we are the problem, and we are a huge problem in terms of central banking, you have to recognize that not having any freedom to touch the system may be awesome or terrible. Mm -hmm. or a combination of the two, or mm -hmm. it might change from situation to situation. But, you know, you're not, you're not the rowboat yet. You're not in the rowboat yet. You're still on the giant cruise ship. You can still afford to have people saying crazy, Bitcoin-y, hard money, Austrian economics things. Because we're, we're not that big. Mm -hmm. But you're headed there. You're headed to being the grown-ups in the room. You know, there's this point at which, like, the president of the academy salutes you. What happens when the head of Harvard University comes to the Winklevoss twins and says, hey, you guys are the success story. What is it that you want to see? They may not be expecting that. Mm -hmm. But what I'm trying to say is, I think you're going to be the big dogs if you're not careful, and you better start acting like it. Good advice. So I want to revisit this point you made. The Amer when the American dream stopped paying a dividend, this was the inflection point downward. One way, perhaps, to describe the American dream was you come to this place, you work really hard, you retire early, you do what you want kind of thing. In my mind, then the American dream is somewhat pragmatically captured by the US Treasury yield, right? If you could save up 10 or $30 million or whatever the number and you just put it in treasuries and it yields 5% a year, that's your retirement. 
clearly that has collapsed. Um, I'd like to know if you if you see it that way too, that the American dream is sort of quantified in that. And then to your, your point earlier about money, I agree that it's not everything. And it does sound, it's off-putting perhaps even to talk about money or have a show called The What Is Money Show. People think your money is no, 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 whatever. No, no, no. That's why I tried to say, distrib- I forget what I said, something about like distributed freedom. I forget what, what the phrase I used. Oh, fungible freedom. Money is fungible, fungible freedom. freedom. Yeah. Fungible freedom. Yeah. Yeah, because money sounds like it's worst use to a lot of people, which is one of the reasons, you know, when I hear that guy's got a lot of money, for some reason, my brain imagines he's got a gold plated toilet as opposed to he can afford uh, a life saving operation for uh, his great grandchild, you know, right, right, right. We, we just think about money in terms of its worst uses. Yes. And the, the paradox here that I think a lot of Bitcoiners would agree about is yeah, they're, we're money geeks, but we're focused on fixing the money so that we can actually stop thinking about money. I know. Like, like it'd be great to have this trust minimized thing we don't have to think about. And it just, it's the accounting system for favors we're rendering to one another. And then we're all freed up to pursue higher things, which gets you into this world like I you're describing. You. Yep. People that are going to work in something meaningful, right? Whether it's to create a legacy or work in an ER yeah. or do something meaningful to them to, right. to put their skills to highest and best use. Yeah. So although there's a bunch of money geeks in Bitcoin, I think in general, they're pointed at it for the right reasons. I like yeah. to think I could be wrong, but what do you think about that? And what do you think about the American dream and the US treasury early retirement thing? Is that kind of the market Indicator well, it wasn't the just collapse. the tre- I mean, the okay. treasury yeah. could only pay that if the market was delivering in general. There was a question about who was going to be exposed to the equities and who was going to have direct exposure because they owned a, a business. And all, there's a whole bunch of things that go into the idea that we can take money out of the system and put it into our lives so that we live better than our parents. We give something beautiful to our children. We know that they have the same prospects and the same hopes. Also a measure of autonomy. You know, a man's home is his castle. Typically the idea is that the white picket fence, the house in the suburbs is an idea of, I want to build something to have my family to be left alone, Mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, it needs to pay a dividend. We need to get a lot of homes that are currently uh, inhabited by older people into the hands of younger people who can uh, make babies and fill them up with the next generation. <laughs> uh, I've never seen anything like the collapse of interest in family and in children. It's people definitely become don't, it's yeah. definitely become more expensive. Well, and, and more implausible. I mean, I, I'd like to see people who are within four years of each other's birthdays being attracted to each other and able to have kids i'm seeing a lot of uh couples that are decades apart because it takes a long time for a guy to accumulate enough wealth and i i think that you know gosh i think that our young women are up against completely insane pressures on them that Mm -hmm. can't be met and this family child rearing thing is more or less, if it's not almost a right that everybody can achieve, you've got a society in real trouble. Mm -hmm. And I think it has to do with, it can't be entrepreneurship that is what allows everyone to eat. We can't all be playing roulette trying to win the entrepreneurship game. Hey everybody. As you've no doubt learned by watching this show, Bitcoin is the single most important asset you can own in the 21st century. And one of the most important companies in Bitcoin today is Nidig. Nidig's mission is to get Bitcoin into the hands of as many people as possible. One of the ways they are accomplishing this mission is by empowering banks and financial technology companies to offer their own Bitcoin products and services. As a true game changer in the industry, Nidig is safely unlocking the power of Bitcoin for forward-thinking individuals and institutions alike. 
led by Robbie Gutman, Yin Zhao, and Ross Stevens, Nidig has absolutely exploded onto the Bitcoin scene recently and has quickly become a leader in this space. So whether you are a professional investor looking for asset management services or a company looking to white label your own Bitcoin product or service, consider Nidig your single source solution for everything Bitcoin. We're going to need to do something in, in which ordinary, non-remarkable individuals are going to have to be able to fall in love with each other and have a couple of kids and a few laughs before it's all done. Yeah, I agreed with that. Um, a number of factors there that, you know, I <laughs> maybe I am just tunnel vision on the money, but there's been a lot of talk about the relationship of manipulating money and disincentivizing the nuclear family, right? Not only for reasons that... I'm, Assume that that's all true. Let, let's yeah. go to where you want to go. Okay. Yeah. Well, I see that, and I don't know, maybe this is a result of me being closer to Bitcoin or community than you, but I see these kind of personal transformations unfolding in Bitcoiners, where people that were formerly not interested in marriage or kids or health or whatever, they start to turn the dials in positive directions. But uh, they have a future. Yeah, by re and really just as a consequence of engaging with the money that gives them more ability to plan for the future, I guess. Well, no, again, I, it's not like I don't, that is part of what we want. Now, here's the question. Assume that you fix the money and assume that I were also right, which is maybe the real problem that we have is that we built an entire economy on a stream of innovations mm -hmm. and those innovations mostly didn't come from our brilliance they mostly came from us having instruments that could see new things mm -hmm. so do we imagine that if we fix the money we'd go back to the earlier levels of innovation i don't think so i think there was a one-time bonanza that was present in the 19th and 20th centuries that we're never going to see again. I think there are other bonanzas yet to come that we mm -hmm. are going to be one and done themselves. And so if you want to say, well, they, these are different bonanzas, but I think we stumbled into some new orchards and we were able to pluck all of the low hanging fruit really quickly, which gave us a sense of invincibility. We didn't think, okay, well, this is, a, this is an orchard. And if we ravenously pluck everything, Mm -hmm. we're going to have a new problem. But yeah, I, I believe that if you fix the money right now, you'd have a hard time coming up with enough new business opportunities that weren't software companies. Hmm. You see, I think we used to learn things just by looking at the world at different layers of resolution. Mm -hmm. Before... In the middle of the 20th century, we didn't know about macromolecules in biology, mm -hmm. really. And then, you know, we, we figured out alpha helix and beta sheets and protein. We figured out the double helix and the genetic code, the transfer hypothesis. So we could see a lot more. You know, we figured out much more about what atoms and molecules were like and what we could do. And so after we got through with chemistry, we figured out what we could do with nuclei. Um, and the big one that's been continuing is the semiconductor. Mm -hmm. Because once you understand the semiconductor junction, you, what you want to do is build a logical castle on that foundation. So it may be a physical substrate of a semiconductor, but the logical um, structure is the logic gate, which can be, you know, is so expressive that it can be used to make arbitrary computers and arbitrary programs. So you and I don't think of ourselves as communicating through zeros and ones because I, I see your face. You and I have met in person. It's pretty amazing. I can hear your voice. I recognize it. All of this is zeros and ones. And that is the revolution that we're still going through. But I think that if that, I worry that if you fix the money, you're going to figure out what your problems are. Bad money has been disguising the problems. 
But I think if you had hard money, you might suddenly find that you're staring yourself in the face saying, we can't come up with innovations at the rate that the 20th century did. Wouldn't that still be a better outcome, though, just to face the truth, even if it's bad? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's why I hang out with you guys. <laughs> but no, no I'm, I'm, I'm quite serious about it. You're, you keep trying to say the same sorts of things repeatedly, which is like, isn't it better to have better money than worse money? Isn't it better to have nobody controlling it than bad people controlling it? Don't we feel like... There's a lot of things downstream from money. Isn't this about the incentives? Mm. Like all of this is just money geekery. You can do this in a normal economics department. You can do it in a renegade uh, group of pirates. But money geeks correctly understand that the world is about incentives and that money is the most efficient way of communicating incentives um, when you're comparing apples and oranges. Mm -hmm. Right? That's... That's why it's fungible is because you need to compare an apple to an orange. Yes. Yes. So agreed with you on those points, except I would add that many of the topics you discuss, and maybe this is just money geekery reaching beyond its own uh, no, no, no. domain here, uh, are at least trying to establish explanatory power for some of these topics. So for instance, inflation right we we have these embedded growth obligations we know we can't hit them but through the miracle of inflation we can hit these nominal growth targets uh but that very distortion is what's suppressing growth right we're, we're misallocating capital through inflation so we're mitigating economic growth and i would say this actually is uh engendering the disc you described, the distributed idea suppression complex, because it's through voluntary exchange, through free trade, that our ideas are being tested in the marketplace and sharpened, right? What works, what doesn't work, the market's figuring that out. When you introduce noise into that channel or involuntary exchange, let's say into the system of voluntary exchange. Or let's call it fog. Fog, yeah, you get idea distortion. Fog of war and the fog of the markets from central banking. When the central bank pours fog into the market, we can't tell what our incentives are. We can't tell who's really doing a good job. It's like you look at yes. the uh, White House ceremony for electric vehicles and one electric electro uh, vehicle maker is not represented. The guy's name apparently is Elon. You know, you're, you're sort of trying to understand the world as mediated by ridiculous people. And to take it one step further, that fog mm -hmm. in the markets becomes the fog of war. I know. That's why I chose fog. <laughs> right? That's what you're trying to say. Yeah, I, I think just for me, you know, the first time I listened to your podcast, Eric, was episode one. And just to... With Peter, yeah. And to hear you guys laying out all many of the things we're discussing right now, but not, and I'm not saying you have to determine like, oh, it was the money, but to not hear money being identified as at least a contributor to a lot of these things. That's I mean, you, what you have to, you know, that it's huge for both Peter and, and myself. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's about that's why I was surprised. money. Well, no, but. You see, you know that say what WTF happened in 1971? Of course. That's part of the problem. This is that you're also pissing people off. Because let's assume that you're right or that I'm right. Let's assume that you say that um, going off the gold standard in the final um, split between fiat and gold is what caused everything. And I say, no, 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 you don't understand. The reason it broke then is because of what was happening in science and that the underlying engine of innovation had broken. And that's why the money broke. Fix the science, fix the world would be like my, my sort of thing. And I agree. <laughs> okay. But we, whatever it is, the Bitcoiners have now focused everyone on Bretton Woods. Mm -hmm. And everyone needed to be partially focused on Bretton Woods, but they also needed to be thinking more broadly. And so I do think if we have a disagreement, my feeling is for people who are under-focused on money, they need to think about money all the time. 
because they won't understand the world they're in. Right. And, and you see, people have never had money yeah. and have only had a salary, aren't aware of what it feels like, you know, to have one year that's a bonanza and another year that's meh. Yeah. So, yes, certain people need to think about money a lot more. My friends, the money geeks, need to think about money a little bit less uh, dramatically. Mm. Because, you know, Naval, of all people, you know, big crypto guy, makes this point about, um, what does he say? Something like a, uh, a happy home, a fit body, and a well-functioning mind. These are things that cannot be purchased and must be earned or mm. something like that. Proof of work. Proof of work. Yeah. And, um, and it's beautiful because the, the, the point isn't that money can't buy happiness. Of course, money can buy happiness. Um, well, you know that. I'm no, I'm you're, you're surprised. You never bought that. yourself some happiness. I'm reminded of a joke by Daniel Tosh. He says, Money can't buy you happiness, but it can buy you a jet ski. And have you ever seen anyone sad on a jet ski? <laughs> <laughs> it's very funny. <laughs> um, money can buy you a fair amount of happiness. And that's one of the ways that Naval really, I think, did a beautiful job with that is, is that. He's not making a point that money can't buy lots of things, it's just that there are a small number of things that really matter. Another one is a permanent place in human history. Yeah. It's very tough. How do you spend money to make yourself a permanent place in human history? You got to not only spend, if you're, that's what you're going to do, you got to choose right. Mm -hmm. And I think all I'm suggesting is, is that the money geeks overvalue money just the way ordinary people undervalue money as an explanatory variable. I think that is a fair critique. Um, the world's very complicated, very difficult to trace arrows of causality through complex systems and everything's multivariate. So I completely agree with that. Um, and I guess when you're, what's the old saying, when you're a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. So, well, yeah, the key point is, uh, to a man with a market, <laughs> you know, like that's sort of the, the funny thing. The market has a feature that's common to machine learning and neural nets. When we get a neural net trained and it works really well, mm -hmm. we often don't really understand how it did its work. Hmm. We exposed it to data and then it builds itself and then it sort of works or doesn't work on that basis. Mm -hmm. In a certain sense, the market is really like that. It's like artificial general intelligence. It's not intelligent, but it seems to know what to do to direct people to do things. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that, it, you know, that's, that's the thing that we can't get around is there, there's nothing in the world. Here's how I would make your case. I would say we've, we don't have anything we can do to take over from the market. If the market ended tomorrow and you had a dictator and the full use of an army, you wouldn't be able to direct everybody to do what they would have been doing to keep the world functioning. So if you think about it, it's like air too. Uh, I'm going to go into the kitchen after we're done and uh, make myself some lunch. And I'm counting on the idea that there will be air there. I haven't, I haven't, planned ahead and said, I'll have an oxygen tank waiting for me in the kitchen. Yeah. I just assume that the air is wherever I'm going to be. Mm -hmm. It sounds absurd even to say it. Well, maybe you, maybe you drive like this. You assume that there are gas stations that are everywhere. Mm -hmm. Well, we assume that the market is everywhere because if the market isn't everywhere, like if I want to take my son out for lunch, I'm imagining that there are restaurants whose names I know around me that are open now not knowing that I'm planning to come. Mm -hmm. It's because there's this force field called money in the market that's everywhere, that's causing people to wait around. If I happen to visit them twice in a year, they're going to be there. Mm -hmm. Now, it's amazing to me how many people don't concentrate on the market because it's like air. They don't see it. They expect it. They wouldn't know what to do without it. But the same thing is true of culture. You see, in part, you don't expect to get into a shouting match when you go to a restaurant or when you mm -hmm. take your kid 
movie. You don't expect that simply driving in traffic is going to expose you to road rage and somebody from organized crime is going to, you know, put, put your lights out because you took a bad right turn. Mm -hmm. You expect all sorts of things, whether it's the police, whether it's civility, whether it's that when you speak that you will be answered in the language that, uh, that you've chosen to speak in, in your country, whatever these expectations are that are necessary for daily life, we run the risk of forgetting about them. The great danger with money is that people forget that it's causing people to do all sorts of things because it works almost invisibly. Mm. And I think that's one of the reasons that you guys keep talking about money and the money geek sort of agenda is for people to stop imagining everything is upstream of money because many things are downstream. I totally agree with that, by the way. Most things are downstream of money. Mm but don't overdo it. Fair advice. Um, and I think you make an excellent point that it, it is the relative invisibility of money. I'm reminded of that. Um, this is water, that commencement speech. Have you ever heard that? One goldfish passes another and in, you know, in passing or whatever. And he says, Hey, you know, how's the water? And the goldfish looks around and says, you know, what the hell is water? Is <laughs> yeah. You know. So I think Bitcoiners or the money geeks, if you want to call us that, which I guess you can put the gold bugs in there too. They've been kind of yeah. beating this drum for a long time. And the fiat guys the, yeah, just focus on money is, 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 a, is a defining characteristic. Go ahead. Yeah. And, and Bitcoiners, you could almost say are just better equipped or better armed gold bugs, right? We just have money that actually works. Um, we're, Perhaps our zealousness in highlighting this aspect of socioeconomic reality is an autoimmune response of some kind to its invisibility because the invisibility of money or the, the waterness yeah, of money, was, that's, that's how central bankers have gotten away with this for so long, right? It's like, so long as you only think one layer deep about money and you see that your house goes up every year, inflation's normal, stocks go up according to monetary debasement, then and you, you don't think second order or beyond, then great. Fiat currency is a beautiful, effective illusion. Um, so I think Bitcoiners are just trying to, you know, pull up the curtain, so to speak, and say, look, there's a there's a wizard behind the curtain or a guy well, behind the curtain I mean, pretending to be the wizard. The thing that I want, this is where I, I feel very closely allied with the Bitcoin communities. I can't stand to be living on the Truman Show with a universe of Trumans who haven't figured it out yet. Yeah. Bingo. And, you know, look, the game is to try to figure out how to make decentralized computing work at the level of money, work at the level of contract for whatever it's meant to be. Mm -hmm. In other words, I don't think we know what this innovation really is we haven't had it for long enough we haven't figured out enough about it mm -hmm. I, i'm actually very attracted to the bitcoin idea of let it be money before we let it be anything else let's not get fancy because the more things you add on to money maybe money is pretty well designed to begin with it's like trying to redesign the sphere mm. you know it's like hey we, 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 have you ever noticed how a volleyball and a baseball and a basketball are pretty much the same shape? We, we should try a cube, a game played with a cube. Well, that's probably not going to work nearly as well as the sphere. The sphere is optimized. And I yeah. think that in a certain sense, the Bitcoin community has this strong feeling that don't mess with money. Money is a good enough idea as it is. The trick is to say less. It's like, it's like a soloist who has to learn what not to play. Uh, on the guitar if they yeah. want to sound great. No, that's a great point. I love the sphere analogy because the sphere is the most energetically efficient three-dimensional structure. And I think you could look at Bitcoin that way is that it's automating the functions of a central bank today. So how many tens of thousands of people, probably into the hundreds of thousands, if you look at the related industries, trying to predict what central bankers are doing, et cetera, et cetera, like you can do all that in code now effectively. So 
fix the science, fix the world. Isn't fix Bitcoin, the money, fix the world too. Isn't Bitcoin scientific money? I mean, aren't we just kind of saying the same thing and like coming out of well, different ways? <laughs> but but I'm super excited about it. I mean, it's it's like you have to appreciate it. I literally don't understand why we're concentrating so much efforts in so much of our effort in the desire to be wise stewards of this planet alone. Mm. You see, destructive technology is going to get cheaper and easier to wield. Right. That means that you're going to have to count on more and more human beings not doing really dumb stuff. <laughs> like they shouldn't put spike proteins on viruses that are <laughs> specifically friendly to human lung tissue. You know, like that would be a bad thing. That would be a bad thing. Right. So, um, so now, do you really want a hundred percent of your effort trying to fix the money on this particular planet in which the science that we already have is terrifying? I want to do that with some of our resources, maybe most of our resources. Mm -hmm. But I personally think you guys are crazy for wanting to stay here and fix this place because we should fix it as much as we can. But imagine that you had the ability to experiment with people who thought like you, as opposed to people who are completely hostile to your, your kind of thinking. I, I don't want to be hybridizing my future with people who don't believe in markets at all. I don't want to be hybridizing my future with people who are highly authoritarian. I don't want to be hybridizing my future with people who want to be perfectly libertarian and can't figure out that institutions matter. I, I have a bunch of very normal sounding things that I want that have become impossible to find. We've got to spread out. You know, think about COVID. How many countries on earth has COVID not found its way into? I mean, there are a few scattered islands, I think, that haven't had a, their first COVID case. Hmm. But what I'm suggesting is you guys should be focusing on the long-term viability of the human race. You guys should be preparing to be the grown-ups in the room. And my, my, my biggest fear, and I say this out of love but without flinching, is that the trauma sustained in all of the criticism of Bitcoin and Bitcoiners and has, has created some sort of communal trauma where you don't realize that you're going to be the grownups hmm. and you're not going to act like the grownups, you know, and you don't want somebody in their late sixties screaming, you know, screw you mom and dad. <laughs> It's not, it's not becoming. And so, you know, my, my thought about it is that what happens when we have the first entire university endowed from Bitcoin? Hmm. Well, I have to thank you because the a theme I'm detecting here is you're persistently challenging not only Bitcoiners, but humanity more broadly to look around the corner right? To think about what's next, to see uh, beyond the horizon, I guess. And um, I think that's extremely important. That's extremely important for the broader fiat culture, which has become very short-sighted. You know, they don't care about beyond their own lifetime or creating intergenerational impact and all these things. But it's also important for Bitcoiners, where maybe we do need to take ourselves more seriously. Than well, this is we're growing this, up. If fast. I can say, if I can say one super offensive thing to the Bitcoin community, please it would be something like this. For for God's sakes, stay at the Four Seasons. Charter, charter your own plane buy the Lambo, do the fun stuff. Hopefully, when you've got that out of your system, you've still got a ton of, of dry powder. And then you have to ask yourself a question. Is, is this relentless pursuit of showing off freedom and status and all of this stuff 
really the, the essence of Bitcoin or is that the other guys? Because the, it's the other guys that don't have a model of the future. It's the other guys that are hanging on to political power into their 80s and maybe their 90s because they can't do anything else. And what I would hope is that the Bitcoin community recognizes that it's getting sucked into fiat envy. You know, you want to you want to hold a, a gala like the Met Gala, where everybody's ooing and eyeing over somebody's ridiculous dress, or I don't know. That doesn't sound like smart. So please get the toys, have the fun, go nuts. Like you, you know, the, the Amish have what is it, Ram Springer? Absolutely, go nuts. Hopefully, when you're done with that, you've got you've got some stuff left over, and then ask yourself. Do I want to follow the fiat people towards just more and more radical accumulation with no point? I've got, I've, I've had the fun. You know, if you've gotten it out of your system, consider building something because nobody else is. And if you want to figure out what the really radical thing to do, it, I, I think it's showing up your parents and your grandparents and your great grandparents by actually building something and doing it in a way that it might be here for 300 years. I mean, you know, I, I'm put in mind of New College in Oxford. And I had the good fortune to be associated with a professor at Oxford who was a fellow at New College. And I think New College is a thousand years old. It was called New College because it was new then. Somebody did not plan ahead. I think it's very funny. Um, think about Think about endowing something for a thousand years. Think about building something that proves that you actually were the grown-ups who could see farther than everybody else. And don't spend all of your time just sort of, you know, looking for the next person who would smile at you. I remember when the when the the El Salvador thing went through, it was a big moment because it was like, okay, a sovereign nation is saying that they take Bitcoin seriously. And the same thing was true with Elon. Okay, well, give yourself an advance. What happens when the U.S. talks about adopting Bitcoin, you know, as a, as a second currency of the United States? Imagine that you blow through a trillion and 10 trillion. Start putting yourself in that hyper successful position and then asking, ask yourself, is, is it time to be a grown up or is it, is it just more of the same? Because right now, the biggest danger is that we don't have anyone leading Nobody's got resources. Nobody's forward thinking. And this is the most painful part. I mean, if there was one community that I was kind of hopeful was going to be super different after tech and hedge funds turned out not to be different, I thought it was maybe going to be the Bitcoiners. Well, we'll see. The jury's still out. Well, thank you for the call to arms and the challenge. I think we all need to have a deeper vision of the future and work towards it so thank you for that well thank you guys i think you guys are, are going to be uh certainly some of the dogs to beat in the future and um, i would like to think that mostly this is just my taking you guys as or more seriously than you take yourselves and good luck thank you for the wisdom all right brother <laughs>